Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's NROUTE webinar. My name is Bennett. I'll be the moderator for today. Our presenter is Aaron Clapp, the director of training at SAI. And as you know, he knows the ins and outs of NROUTE, and today he'll be walking through some of the NROUTE drilling techniques that will hopefully make drilling much simpler for you. After his presentation, we will be able to answer any questions you have either about drilling or any other en route topic. So feel free to put those questions in the chat and we'll answer as many as we can. And we are recording the webinar as always. So if you want to review anything Aaron discusses or save it, share it with someone else after we're finished, we'll be sending you all the link in an email this afternoon. So look out for that. And with that, we're ready to start the presentation. So I'll turn it over to Aaron. All right, sounds good. So um, we have, uh, so drilling techniques and things like that with advanced drilling. We wanted to go into some, some topics um, that were, we wanted to go over some of the drilling aspects in NROUTE that are probably, or maybe a little more uncommon um, and just kind of go over those and, and see if you have any questions on those. So first of all, uh, to get to our drilling, um, I'm gonna pull out this little toolbar. Um, so I'm gonna left click and hold, and I'm gonna pull this out just so that I have it handy here. Uh, some of the things that we can do in uh, en route for drilling, and a lot of you probably already know some of these, uh, but are, are more familiar is placing a drill point. We have a drill circle, drill array, placing a center, uh, a drill point at the center of an object, drilling along a contour, and then drill corners of a plate. So we're gonna go over, not all of these, but we're gonna go over probably um, uh, the drill array, the drill at the center of an object, and the drill uh, along the contour. And then we're gonna go through some of the more advanced stuff that's in it uh, for, for just our reference sake. So the first one that I'm gonna probably go over is we'll just go over quickly drilling at this uh, point at the center of an object. This is really great, um, and you're probably familiar with this. It allows you to put the drill hole right at the center of a circle or a square or really any object that you select. Uh, it doesn't really limit you to what that center is going to be. It just puts it at the center of that object. So it could be a rectangle, a square, an oddly shaped part, or a circle. I would say probably 90% of the time it's gonna be a circle. The advanced portion of this, or the uh, kind of the different part that we're gonna talk about is utilizing some of the features that are in the place a drill point at the center of an object. You're gonna be using this most of the time when setting up uh, either a strategy for your ATP, or if you have a part like this that I've just pulled in, this is the side of a cabinet, uh, drawer here, the uh, cabinet with the drawer, I think is what this is. And uh, so we're going to use that to help us create uh, holes a little bit e easier. Easier. So first thing I'm going to do is the nice thing about what we're going to look at here is the ability to place holes with a specific diameter. So we know that if we highlight a certain amount of holes and we click on the place drill point at the center, we know that, that by default, um, it's set to all contours, which basically means it'll put a drill point at the center of all the contours I have selected. So if I have uh, a bunch of stuff highlighted like this, and I click on it, it's gonna place a drill point everywhere, which is not necessarily what we want. So, if you're using a, a DXF file that looks like this, and now I will admit this particular uh, DXF file has layers in it. So I could actually go in here and sort by layers, but we're gonna pretend as if that we don't have that advantage. Uh, we're gonna pretend that we don't have the advantage of having it split up into layers and it's just all in one big artboard. The benefit here is that I can select all objects that are in my screen. I can click the drill at the center of an object. I'm gonna clear this out. We'll use our five millimeter here, give it a depth. I can just then define circles only. Now I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at my circles here. And uh, I modified these a little bit so they're not an exact diameter, 
which is kind of unfortunate, but that's okay. So if we click on this, I'm going to bring up my precision input center by hitting F2. And these holes are 0.1969, so these are supposed to be 5 millimeter holes. And then these out here, these bigger ones, I just made these a little bit bigger so that we would have something to look at here. And so these bigger holes are at 0.4469. So those are my two hole sizes. So I'm going to highlight everything. I'm going to even include the text. It doesn't really matter. I hit place the center of an object. And then I'm going to choose circles only. Then I'm going to choose, well, do I want to apply all circles or do I want to do it by diameter? Well, in this case, I'm going to say by diameter. I'm going to clear out that with my five millimeter in again here because I canceled out of it earlier. I'm going to put in my diameter. So I'm going to have it check the diameter. Now, what's really important about this is that when you look at your holes, you want to make sure that when you select the hole, that your width and your height uh, are exactly the same. If these are off by a little bit, so this one, so if this one were to say, you know, 0 0.1969, and then this one says 0 0.1970, that's technically not a circle. That's an oval. And so it will actually remove that as part of a drawing. So be aware that if that happens, that's kind of an issue. Just that might happen in case it doesn't apply. You want to make sure and uh, leave that set that way. So what we're, what we're going to do in this case is we're going to set our check diameter. So we're going to set it at 0.1969. And then we're going to set a tolerance. Now, there shouldn't be any tolerance or there shouldn't be any differences. But let's just say for whatever reason, if there was slightly different sizes in the circles by a certain amount, and you just wanted to make sure of that, you can set a tolerance. So we could say as long as it's 0.01. So as long as it's 0.18 or 0.2, uh, I guess, in this case, uh, we, we, it would still apply it. So we'll put our tolerance in here and then click OK. okay. So now what it's done is, as before, it put a hole everywhere. This time it, grabbed, it found all the holes that were 0.1969 and grabbed them. This is so much easier then having to sit here and highlight and then hold shift and highlight. And in this particular case, it's actually not too hard to do this because of the way NROUTE selects. So it's not too hard, but imagine if you had a file that was way more complicated. In this case, all I have to do, the difference is maybe 15, 20 seconds worth of selecting. But if you had to do this for like a, a large amount of parts, this can save you a ton of time. So I'm going to grab the same parts again. I'm going to hit this again. This time, I'm going to hit my other uh, diameter, so 0 0.4469. And I'm going to put my tolerance back down to 0 0.001. So you can see that this will work with uh, other settings as well. Um, and then I will hit OK. So now it's put a hole or a drill point right at the center of these circles here. So now I've got two different parts, super easy. And now I can start going through and signing my other tool paths to this particular object. So when we're looking at the place drill point at the center of an object, this can be really, really helpful in terms of sorting out a messy uh, part. Or I've actually had guys have this happen to them. They get a DXF file that has all the parts for the cabinet in the same DXF file, and they're just all bundled, ju jumbled in there. And if you had something like that, this could save you a ton of time using that. So I would highly recommend if you're doing any kind of cabinets like this and you're, you're hand building them, or you're getting files like this from customers to cut out, and they have the holes already done, this is a great option to save a little bit of time so you don't have to sit there and do that. If that is if, um, that is if you don't have layered uh, DXF files. Now, if you have the layered DXF files, this makes things a lot easier for you anyway. You can just grab the the DX, the DX layer that you need and then uh, just select all of them. So, uh, But this is a little time saver if you've got that. So the other one we want to talk about is um, on a contour. 
So let's go ahead and start up a new document here. And let's go and create something like this. Okay, we're just going to do that right there and just apply it. And we'll use this as our shape. So let's say that we want to drill uh, some holes along the edge of one of these contours. Let's say just around the edge of the middle of this. So right along the, the edge here. So I can select this contour and click here. And then I can set a bunch of settings in terms of holes. Now, if I want those, obviously I don't want them to be along the edge. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually grab this, create an inline, and I'm gonna say, make this one square because I want it square. And let's just say these holes need to be 0.25 inches in from the middle. So we're gonna hit apply, close. And now I'm gonna select this object, and this is gonna be the object I'm gonna base my, my holes on. So then now I can simply click drill along the contour. I can select my five millimeter drill, and then I can do several different things here. I can force it to hold by number. So I can say I want 16 drills, and it'll space them out evenly along this. So it'll put 16 drills on there and then make sure they have all the same exact spacing between them. Or if I decide to hold spacing, it will prioritize spacing over number. So if it decides that um, it can't fit 16 in there, it won't fit 16, depending on the spacing that you've provided. Um, number at spacing. So this will this will give you a little bit of a different option. So it holds the number at the spacing that you provided. Uh, and I think it it uh, what it does, it gives you a, uh, another option where it keeps them at the spacing as much as possible. And then it might, at the end, kind of bunch them together. Uh, all corners just means all corners, inside corners, outside corners. So you just have a number of different options here. So we're going to say hold by number. We're going to say 16. And then, of course, the spacing, we can set that. But uh, we're just going to leave it at 0 and hit OK. So this will automatically place these at an even interval in between all of these. Now, if we decide to change this, let's go ahead and remove these tool paths. We can also do the same by, let's take a look at this one, hold spacing. And in this case, we want the spacing to be, um, let's do 4.5 inches apart. And here, here's where your hold spacing gives you the option to force the last drill. So if you wanted just to force it in there, it will allow you to force that. Um, hit OK. And so in this case, what it's done is it's prioritized the spacing at 4.5 inches apart on each one of these. And of course, uh, I didn't have the force, the last drill spacing set. So it left a bigger gap here than it did on the rest of them. So if I told it to force the spacing, then it would uh, force a tool, uh, a, a drill in there. So let's go ahead and do that, force the spacing, hit OK. So now it forced in an additional one right here, even though this distance between here and here is not equal to this and this, it gives us a little bit of a different object there. Now, uh, the other thing you can do here is, let's delete that and reapply is uh, number at spacing. So uh, again, this one automatically forces the last drill for you. Uh, so that's kind of the difference there. So that's uh, drill contours on a line. Fairly simple, pretty easy to do. The last one we want to kind of talk about here is the drill array. And this one can kind of get a little confusing. Um, it's not used by as many. Uh, mostly because a lot of times if you're building cabinets, you usually already have a DXF with the holes already in it. But if you're building a cabinet from scratch and you have no DXF files, this one is a pretty useful one to have. And so I'm going to clear all this out and kind of want to just briefly go over the settings here. So you've got your columns and rows. That's pretty easy. Uh, but the ones down here are the ones that can be a little bit confusing. So the first one here is by overall width. 
What this means is that it's going to place a drill at a set distance. So for example, let's say we're going to go 0.25 here. We're going to say set it at width. And I'm going to say, how many do we have? Four? Okay, so what this is going to do is this going to place four drills, one at the beginning, one at the end, and then it's going to space the two middle ones out evenly along a 10-inch line. And I'm going to go ahead and say by graphic just because it allows me to place it wherever I want. Uh, you can also do it by X, Y coordinate if you need to. So we'll hit OK. It's going to give me this little cursor. I'm going to place it right here. So what this does is it places a 10-inch line. It places one at the beginning, one at the end, and then two evenly spaced out at the middle. So again, this kind of is very similar to the contour option, except for uh, it gives you, it doesn't, draw the line. You just don't have the line with it at this point. The one that's going to be more common for everybody to use, though, is going to be by horizontal spacing. And this is going to be important if you're doing like shelf holes, because most of your shelf holes for adjustable shelving on like a like a like a tall shelf, like you get at IKEA or something like that, they've got all the holes down the side, is going to be by horizontal spacing. Now, we know that Typically, those holes are 32 millimeters apart. Um, so the equivalent to that in inches is 1.2598. 1.2598. That is your 32 millimeter equivalent in inches. So if I set this by horizontal spacing, that means I'm going to get four drills in four columns, and I'm going to get them exactly 32 millimeters apart. I'm going to do it by graphic again, hit OK. Oh, in this case, uh, it's just going to adjust this one because we edited it. So now I'm going to get, instead of a 10-inch or a 4-inch or however long I defined, I'm getting one drill every 32 millimeters. This is going to be the way that you would very easily set up, set up drill holes for adjustable shelving. Now, here's what's really cool as well is let's say that I want to do two sets of adjustable shelving holes on the same part evenly spaced. So I can say, well, let's just do two rows and let's just say, I don't know how, how many they typically have, but let's just say there's 20 columns. I'm gonna set my horizontal width at 1.2598 inches, that's our 32 millimeters. And then what I'm gonna do is on this one is instead of, uh, vertical spacing, I'm going to do overall height. And I'm going to set these, let's just say this is a 12 inch inch deep uh, cat or shelf. Hit OK. Zoom out. And so now I have two rows of holes exactly in the same locations. I don't have to worry about whether they're off or they're not. They're exactly in the same location. So these always will match up. So that if you are building a cabinet here, then we can, you know, put our rectangle here, and this would be our shelving unit. Just like that, we can very easily create some adjustable shelving. So that's just a number that's also kind of handy just to know that 1.2598. That is your 32 millimeters in horizontal spacing. So we can do the same thing vertically if we want. Uh, we could switch this around. We could do vertical spacing. 1.2598, and then we could set it by overall, and we said, I can't remember what we put in there, but let's just do 15. We can do the, oh, that didn't work out right. Uh, I think I'm going to need to adjust that here, so let's, let's try again. So, oh, we need to adjust, here we go, we need to adjust this as well, duh. So we need to switch this. So this is gonna be two and 20. What we what we messed up on. There we go. So now we could do it the opposite way. So you can do it either way. And so now we've got these exactly lined up holes. So that's that's something to know about the advanced drill array. Now, we've kind of gone over some of those. Let's go ahead and just take a look at some of the advanced settings inside of the drill point function. So we can take a look at what some of those are as well. So let's just create a standard drill point. I'm going to hit clear. We're going to go with um, 
you know, we're going to go with a end mill here first, and we'll see why in a minute. So I'm going to grab a, an end mill. Okay, so now I'm going to click on the three little dots to go into the advanced, uh, some of the uh, more advanced settings like fees and speeds. Uh, and there's a couple options here by default. So uh, by nature, when you apply a drill point in en route, it is a up and down movement. So very simple. You go, you uh, your tool goes over there, it plunges and it, and it retracts. So you have two movements. Uh, if you apply a drill hole to the to a point that is larger than the tool, it doesn't make the tool large or doesn't make the hole larger. It simply um, plunges there, and whatever size tool you have there is that's what you get. So. If you have an eighth inch tool or a five millimeter drill or a quarter inch drill, that's what you get. Um, there is an option here. And by default, the diameter by tool is what it's default set to because most of the time that's what you're doing. There is an option here by exact diameter. Let's say that you're trying to drill a hole that you don't have the tool for. Let's say it's a 10 millimeter or something like that. And all you have is an end mill, maybe you have a quarter inch end mill or something like that, or an eighth inch end mill, whatever tool you have, you can select exact by a diameter. Now you obviously, you wouldn't wanna check this option with a drill because drills don't typically have the ability to cut side to side. They, they're purpose built for plunging and then retracting. So if you're gonna do this option, you wanna be using some kind of bit that has the ability to cut left to right, obviously an end mill or something like that. So we can choose by exact diameter, and then we can tell it what the diameter we want it to cut at. So let's we're using this eighth inch tool. Let's just say 0.5 inches. If I hit OK and hit OK again, oh, I didn't choose by graphic, so I'll put it down here. So here is what it created for us. So it gives us a slightly different looking crosshair. It gives us a circle inside and then another circle on the outside. Now let's go ahead and look at this and what it does when in the perspective view uh, when we simulate the ortho. So we'll zoom in here so we can kind of see it and we'll hit play. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna plunge and it's gonna move out, go around in a circle and then pull back out. So what this does is this allows you to easily apply a drill point uh, to a hole that's slightly larger than your tool in case you don't have that, that size of tool. Again, we'll just look at that real quick just so you guys can see it. But it plunges in, it goes to the edge, cuts around, and then goes back to the middle and then retracts. So it's an easy way to apply uh, a quick tool. Now, you, you can do the same thing with a, a routing offset. I prefer to use this option versus the routing offset just because I like to keep my drills as drills and my routing offset as routing offset. This will real, this actually will come into play when you're doing your ordering. So when you do your ordering for your cut order, it's a little easier if you don't have a bunch of tools that are being duplicated in routing offset versus drilling. So you can say, I want my drilling done first. And even though that is kind of like a routing offset type of uh, function, it's still gonna maintain it as a drill so that I can separate it as something that's drilling. Uh, so that, that helps because typically you do drilling at the beginning of the file. So I prefer to use this option right here. So that exact diameter is a really nice option for, uh, for that. Um, depth to shoulder, this is what I'm just gonna comment about here real quickly. Obviously we know what the shape of a drill looks like. Um, and so drill, uh, let's grab our tool library here just to kind of have a visual and let's go to our type. Let's go to drills. So if we look at a drill, uh, it has this little taper, obviously. The drill to shoulder means that we are going to take the drill and it's going to plunge all the way to the shoulder, not to the tip. So it's gonna, this actually is going to go a little bit deeper. So whatever your H2 value is, whatever that height is, NRAL is going to add a little bit of depth so that the shoulder goes to the depth that you've defined. 
So just be aware of that. That's what the depth to shoulder is. So if you're looking at your output file and you're not exactly sure what it's doing there, that's that's what the, the depth to shoulder is. Um, and, and, and so you can uh, be aware of that. That is an uncheckable option. You, I can't uncheck that. The only way that you could get around that would be to um, just use an end mill or to use a drill and set it up with a zero for the H2 value. The next one that we want to kind of talk about is going to be your pec lift. So your pec lift is something that uh, is used to push the bit down and then lift back up a little bit. This allows you to kind of do kind of like a little bit of a tapping type function, especially if you're going into like hard metals and you need it to clear chips and, and take a break for a second from the drilling. You plunge, it pulls back up by that amount, plunge again, pulls back up, and it keeps doing that until it gets down. So we can define this by, you know, whatever value we want, and it'll retract the bit just a little bit, whether it's for, you know, to help it cool off, uh, to get more lubrication in there, uh, or if we're trying to uh, help it get the chips to clear out, whatever the case there, uh, that allows you to do that right there. Um, so we talked about diameter. The, uh, the countersink is the other one that we'll take a look at here after tapping. Uh, we'll do uh, tapping. So tapping is uh, for threads. Now, something that's interesting about tapping is we'll need to know several different things. So if I check this box um, right here, uh, I'm going to need to set my thread units. So I need to set the thread units and then set my thread pitch. Now, this is going to be something that's going to be defined in the tool that you purchase. So it'll tell you what the thread pitch I can cut. So you're going to put that in there. Now, the other unique thing about the uh, the tool here is that when I when I check this box, it automatically syncs the spindle speed and the plunge rate together. So typically, these are tools that will um, work in a very specific way in terms of you need to plunge down at and and at very specific RPM. So using tapping is going to be one of those things where you have to have a special tool for it, obviously. And then your machine also has to be able to go in reverse. So that's going to be something to be aware of. So it'll need to plunge down and then plunge back out in reverse. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to ruin your 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 taps or your threads. Um, so and then also your machine also has to be able to run at very low RPMs. Now, that's going to be defined by your tool. Typically, it typically when you buy the tool, it'll give you a bunch of information about, you know, what the RPM that they re recommend and what kind of plunge rate and things like that. What I do is let's just say this tool needs to be run at uh, 1500 RPM. So I, I put in 1500 and my plunge rate is automatically assigned. So it's like a one for one type of ratio here. So we're plunging at 150 or 1500 inches per minute at 100, yeah, 1500 RPM. So that's usually pretty high. Uh, I guess it depends on the, on the tool, but usually you're gonna be going very, very low. So even if I set this at 200, for example, then that ties my plunge rate together. So they're kind of tied because you want them to be kind of set correctly. Because if you set your plunge rate incorrectly with your spindle, then what you're going to get is the 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 threads aren't going to look right. So they'll definitely be wrong. So just be aware of this. So this is tapping. So if you're using that kind of bit, there's a couple things just to be a remember as review. You have to have the special tool, obviously, and then your spindle has to be able to go in reverse when it gets to the bottom and needs to reverse back out. And then uh, you also have to be able to go at a very low RPM, which would be defined by the tool. Uh, so then when I uncheck this, we'll notice here that if I go to 18,000 RPM, our plunge rate stays the same. So that just links the two together. So just so you know, when it does that, not to be alarmed. So that's tapping. What is the, well, the last thing that we want to talk about then is just going to be real quickly here, uh, since we've already gone over a half an hour. So is uh, countersinking. So we can do countersinking as well. 
So let's go ahead and go back to a drill point. So we're going to go back to a five millimeter drill. And then I'm going to use a conic tool for uh, setting a countersink. So I'm going to set this at, I don't know, we'll just say 0.5 inches. That's fine. Uh, this is probably not going to go down to 0.5 inches. We're probably going to go not as far. So maybe 0.125 or something like that, whatever that depth needs to be. And when I click on, so when I add my second tool and I click on the three dots here, the option for countersink now becomes available. When I click on countersink, uh, now I can define the diameter of the countersink. And so it'll be limited to the diameter that I choose here. So whatever that diameter is going to be, whether it be a half inch wide countersink. So, you know, this is where you'll probably measure the head of the bolt or the, uh, the screw or whatever it is that's going into the hole and define that here and click OK. And then and click OK again. And now we're going to get a double, a double tool here. So if we look at the perspective view, I believe that's probably where we're going to see it the best. Perhaps not. Uh, that's kind of hard to see. So let's go back to the side view. I think the, the front view might actually give us a better view. OK, so it's not too easy to see. But you can see here that it went all the way down. Here's our main drill. And then this little triangle right here, this is our countersink. So that's the countersink that it created. And of course, this will be. Uh, will change based on on the size and whatnot, but that's our countersink right there. Now, when countersinking, um, one of the things that's going to be important to do is when you do go into your ordering. So when I go to output and I look at my tool order, I'm going to need to make sure that I, if you want the countersink to happen last, you want to make sure that your drill is on top as number one, and drill uh, your your countersinking tool is number two. So uh, when you look at the toolpath itself, this is kind of a tricky thing, but if you go to edit toolpath, just because I placed the five millimeter on top here, it does not mean that this is always going to go first. You always have to double check your ordering. This is mostly just for the toolpath, uh, and this can actually get switched around. So just be aware of that just because I placed it second here does not mean it's going to output second. You have to actually go through and assign your tools correctly in the output section uh, in order to make sure that the drill happens first and then the countersink um, uh, as well. So that is your countersink option. So that kind of covers everything in drilling. I know there's a, a few little things in there. Again, these are some of the more uncommon things that uh, I would say that we probably don't run into the very often. But they're nice to know that they're there uh, and available to you uh, as well. Actually, one last thing I forgot about, and this is one of those ones that's, again, this is kind of a, a unique, very unique case scenario. But if you go down to here under your text tool and you left click and hold, we also have a thread pitch wizard. The thread pitch wizard is specifically for creating a thread for an object or for a hole that is larger than the size of the bit that you have. So I'm just going to go ahead and create the default one just so we can see it. Apply. It's kind of a large one. But here's what it does is it creates, and let's zoom out here. So it creates a circular pattern. And actually, let's pull that away from the, there we go, just a little bit. It creates a circular pattern. And as you can see here, this allows you to create a bolt pattern that's larger than the, the thread tool that you have. Because most, you're not, if you're, let's say you're doing a three inch hole or something like that, and you want to put threads to it, you're probably not going to go out and buy a three inch threading tool. You're probably going to have a smaller threading tool and you use this. And what this does is it, it cuts along the outside in a downward spiral pattern based on the settings that you did. And then when it gets to the bottom, it switches over to the middle and pulls up. The way that we assign a toolpath to this is via the engraved toolpath. 
So I'm going to click on this. And by doing that, it highlights my entire thread. I'll click on my engraved tool path. I'll put on my tool, whatever that is. We'll just put an end mill in here for now. It uh, doesn't matter which one. Uh, I give it a depth. And this depth doesn't matter because uh, I'm going to choose this option right here. It says follow contour. What this option means is that bit will follow the depth of this exactly. So this depth up here doesn't really matter. It's going to follow this contour all the way down. And then that's how you're going to get a thread or drill a thread or route a thread out for something that's larger than your tool. Um, uh, that way. So be aware that this one is in there as well. We hit OK. And then, of course, we see that that toolpath in here. So this is going to be generating uh, a very special type of toolpath for that. So the, if you're wondering how to do that in terms of because I know we talked about threading or the, the creating threads, I figured I might as well mention this while we're at it. So so that you guys know where that is. That is all the way to the right underneath the the a or the text tool uh, it doesn't have a little red arrow but it does have a fly out menu so be aware of that so now that we've covered kind of everything is there any questions on uh, any of this or or about anything in enrod in general thanks aaron um i see one I question, see. question more from charlie does a counter bore work the same as counter sink um, you know, that's a good question. That might just be a terminology thing. Um, but a countersink is basically just, uh, uh, is just uh, giving us a little bit of space for the head to fit so that it's flush. Now, I don't know if, I, if I'm not familiar with, I'm having a, a moment here. I, I'm not exactly sure if counterboard is different. Uh, than a countersink, but a countersink is just basically putting a cut in it so that when the, the screw or the drill or or whatever it is that you're putting in later, the hardware is below the top surface of the material. So if that's what a counter bore is, then yes. If not, then no. Okay, yeah. so counter bore is uh, tapered. So this would be dependent on the tool, actually. So a countersink, if I use a conic tool, which has a pointed shape to it, so in this case, it'll actually do two. Um, let's go to our tool library here. So it just depends. So in this case, I'm using a, uh, I'm using a conic tool. So this is gonna give me a tapered edge. If I decide to use an end mill, then it would, it, it would do either way. So um, it, it can do both. It just depends on the tool that you decide to use for your countersink or your counter bore. So a countersink would be using a conic, and then a counter bore would probably just using some kind of end mill or some kind of counter boring tool. Because with the with the option in en route, it doesn't really care. It just, whichever one you use is the one you use. Good question though. Thanks, Aaron. Do we have any other questions about drilling or any other en route topic before we close it out for the morning? All right, well, glad we covered it pretty well. Hopefully that kind of helps you. Again, those are kind of some of the most, some of the more uncommon type scenarios in, in which you use uh, drilling and stuff like that, but that's that's uh, that's a good one. Aaron, one more question here from Maria. Could you do another on strategy and pathway? Do you think we could uh, do that in the future? Uh, yes. Um, yes, definitely. Um, actually, uh, so uh, we could definitely look at that for sure. Um, one of the things uh, that we'll be doing in the next couple of webinars, and in fact, we might as well 
put a plug in for a few things here before we go. Um, if you guys have any questions about, or or if you have any any need for training, uh, there is a really great resource that that we have available to you guys as to Flexi and Enroute users. It is called Addendo.com. So it, let me just uh, pull that up here real quick. Uh, Addendo is uh, our new Flexi training. So Addendo.com. So if you want training from uh, people who are in the industry, what we've done is we've created this new website where you can actually uh, go online and we have a bunch of different advisors on here. So I'm on here. Um, Jesse, who is the product manager for Enroute, he is on there. We also have owners of three or four different shops on this website, and you can actually get training from somebody who owns a shop. So this is a really great thing to uh, take a look at. You can sign up for free, and basically you just you can go on there. You can take a look at the description of each person. You can say you know find out what their expertise is. You can send them a message, say hey, can you would you be able to show me how to do this? They'll respond. You set up a session. It's really nice because it has a calendar on there and it shows you when they have available times and things like that. So it's really user friendly. I'd say check that out if you have any questions or you'd really like some training. Um, so Addendo is where to go for, for that. Then in our next couple future webinars, we're actually going to be switching over to the new Enroute 7. So Enroute 7 is new. And it just came out just last week. And so we are going to actually be switching over to that new version. So the next webinar is actually going to be covering the new layout and everything on Enroute 7. So there's a lot of new, new stuff in there, some new features. We're going to start doing our webinars. And we're going to start covering all the new Enroute 7 stuff. So stay tuned for those. And uh, hopefully that'll you guys will really enjoy that stuff. Great. Thanks, Aaron, for answering those questions. And I think that's about all the time we have for today. So we'll go ahead and close it out. Thank you all for joining us for today's Enroute webinar. Uh, we're currently working on setting up the rest of the year's webinars. So you can find those this week on our website, our Facebook events page, or in your email if you're subscribed to our newsletter. Uh, but as Aaron mentioned, next month, our webinar will be on May 18th, and that'll be about some of the new features in Enroute 7, so you won't want to miss that. Uh, thank you again for attending, and we hope you learned something and that you keep creating great things using Enroute. We'll see you next month.